Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul Tutorials in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video we're going to talk about how to design a rocket launcher assuming that you don't want to use a replica. And we're going to start off with a test payload. Uh, rockets have traditionally been designed around a payload specification. Not a particular payload, but a specification. Often this was delivered by the military. They wanted to launch a particular warhead on a particular trajectory or a satellite into a particular orbit. Um, there are exceptions. The Saturn 1, Saturn 5, N1 were not military primarily, but mostly military specifications have taken precedence because the military has had a lot of money. And we're going to go with a specification of 10 tons to low Earth orbit to begin with. And I'm going to use Avgas because I typically do, so we can reduce that diameter and that is a 10 ton mass. The wet mass here is 10 tons and we'll put a quick fairing around it. Though we don't know exactly uh, how big the fairing needs to be, that will depend on our fuel selections. Uh, the hydrogen oxygen engines tend to require wider tanks because hydrogen is not as dense and the other options tend to require thinner tanks. So we're going to temporarily do a 4 meter stage here. So let's talk about the, the fuel options first, because that will largely determine what kind of rocket you're building. If your focus is low Earth orbit, the typical mix is kerosene-kerosene. So uh, kerosene-oxygen first stage, kerosene-oxygen second stage, mainly kerosene-oxygen boosters. And you can tell this by Zenit is the typical, the simple low Earth orbit rocket, and Falcon 9 is uh, fairly simple as well, except it's got nine engines on the first stage. Then it's got one engine on the first stage that's kerosene oxygen, one engine on the second stage that's kerosene, kerosene oxygen. It's basically the simplest rocket you can get. Um, Falcon 9 is also kerosene oxygen on both stages. It can have kerosene oxygen boosters, which is a Falcon Heavy. And the Electron rocket is kerosene oxygen, Angara 1 is kerosene oxygen, and of course the original Soyuz has uh, kerosene oxygen core, kerosene oxygen upper stage, and kerosene oxygen boosters. Um, of course the R7 didn't have the upper stage, but you get the picture. So low Earth orbit, kerosene oxygen uh, nowadays could be replaced with methane oxygen. That would be a very simple low Earth orbit configuration. Now, there are, there's also the inherited ballistic missile, I'd say. Ballistic missiles turned into low Earth orbit launchers. This is the proton class of things. Proton class, uh, hypergolic engines are the ones that use uh, UDMH or, or some form of hydrazine. And it's th this engine here, you can see UDMH, it is a hypergolic engine. And the reason hypergolics were used is because they're storable. And the reason they wanted storable fuels instead of stuff that you uh, fill up on the pad uh, right before launch is because they were meant for ballistic missiles. So um, the Titan class has uh, hypergolic, hypergolic hydrolox, uh, but hypergolic, hypergolic for low orbit and hydrolox only if you're going to higher orbits. And then Proton has hypergolic all the way. Uh, three stages of hypergolic with possible hypergolic uh, further stages that it can be that can be added to it. So that is the sort of protonish rocket. Those are your low Earth orbit launchers. I mean, those are the typical kinds. So other types of Titan class would be like Long March 3, GSLV Mark 3. Those are Titan type rockets. Uh, of course, Titan got uh, solid boosters as well. So, I mean, GSLV Mark 3 has solid boosters as well. Uh, the Proton kind of rocket is like Long March 2, Long March 4, D the Dnieper rocket. Um, and various others that are sort of uh, descended from ballistic missiles. As, uh, setting aside the low Earth orbit launchers, then there's the geosynchronous satellite launchers, or the ones meant for the Moon or Mars or something like that. And these tend to be either kerosene oxygen, then hydrogen oxygen, or just hydrogen oxygen all the way with solid boosters or some other boosters. So Atlas V is a kerosene oxygen first stage and a hydrogen oxygen second stage and it has solid boosters. Uh, Long March 7 or Angara 5 is kerosene oxygen, kerosene oxygen with kerosene oxygen boosters and then a hydrogen oxygen upper stage. Ariane 5 or H2A slash B or Delta 4 
or SLS. Those are Hydrolox all the way with solid boosters. Long March 5 is Hydrolox core, Hydrolox upper stage, and kerosene boosters. And then Delta 4 Heavy is Hydrolox all the way. So we only really see hydrogen oxygen used if we're going to something other than low Earth orbit. Um, the exception being like the shuttle. Uh, because of the unique requirements of the shuttle or Buran or something like that. Uh, because hydrogen oxygen is very expensive to handle and the engines are very expensive. Geosynchronous satellite orbit uh, satellites are very lucrative too, so that makes up for it. Okay, so we have a 10 ton weight and we're trying to get into low earth orbit. So we're not going to look at the Hydrolox options right now because they're expensive. And uh, uh, so we're going to focus on a simple kerosene oxygen stage. And, but what engines are we looking to use? Well, we can estimate the overall size of the rocket uh, basically right away. If we take a look at our uh, kerosene oxygen options, oh, there's the RD-170, so this will be for Zenit. And um, ten, they tend to have a vacuum ISP of around 300 to 337. Three, I mean, 337 is pretty good. Uh, so you're looking at that kind of ISP. And to figure out the overall size of the rocket, and you could use hypergolic as well, kerosene, oxygen, or hypergolic at this uh, for low Earth orbit. And uh, the ISPs tend to be in the same range. So you see for the proton rocket, 315.5, you could get 300s or something. If you're using older technology, it might be in the high 200s. But uh, let's say, let's just go straight, let's assume 300 for our ISP. Well, what you do is you take the ISP of your engine, uh, you take 10,000, divide by it, so let's say 300. So I get 33.33333, and then you multiply by the mass of your payload. And so I get a rocket size of 333 tons. So if you have a pad limit, for instance, in career mode, you can decide whether it's feasible. A 330-ton rocket using 300-second ISP engines should be able to deliver at least this 10-ton payload, assuming uh, decent tanks. Okay, uh, if you have very heavyweight tanks, of course it will not be able to, but it's in the ballpark. So we're expecting a 333-ton uh, um, rocket, and of course if we were using the RD-170 and similar engines with this kind of ISP on the upper stage, then we could do 10,000 divided by 337 and then multiply by the mass that we're trying to deliver and we get a 296 ton rocket. So you can see the benefit of using the more efficient engines and we can immediately estimate what we need. Now, knowing the size of the rocket, we can already figure out what the, what the engine requirement is going to be. We take the, let's say we're going with the 333 ton estimate for the rocket and we want to get off at a thrust to weight ratio of say 1.4, well, we're gonna need 466 tons of thrust or an engine or a combination of engines that have 4,662 kilonewtons. Obviously one RD-170 should do the trick. Uh, it has way more than that, it might be overkill. And if you're trying to keep down costs, you might want to go with a different engine option because this is uh, overkill for that. And uh, we can have, uh, this is more of an upper stage engine. You can see from the sea level ISP here. I'm assuming that you know the stock way of building things. So this is uh, assuming you know the basics. And this is a 350 vacuum ISP, which is very nice. And this is uh, reasonably, so we, we sort of know the thrust of our first stage. What's the thrust of our second stage gonna be? We're expecting two stages here. and. We, we know that we're looking for 4,300-ish, oh sorry, 4,000, let's say 700-ish kilonewtons on the first stage. I would just divide by five for the second stage. And so the second stage, dividing the first stage by five, we get 932 kilonewtons. And that would be a high thing. You can get by with less. Uh, you could get by with as much as dividing, well, some rockets are really bad, like, um, delta for upper stage versus lower stage, but um, you could divide by 10 or something like that. It depends on how much oomph you want and how much delta V you want to get out of the upper stage versus the lower stage. Um, dividing by 5 is okay, dividing by 10 is okay. 
anywhere around there is fine as you're just getting a rough estimate. So this engine falls within that. And that's, I, I knew that already because this is an uh, upper stage engine anyway. But let's let's say um, we could we could manage with this this one as well. Uh, that's uh, more than dividing by ten. We get four hundred and seventy if we divide by ten. Four hundred seventy kilonewtons. We can use this engine. Let's use this engine. It's got a very high ISP, so we could probably manage, and um, that'll break us away from being a Zenit. So we're going to use an integral structure tank. We'll try and match the fairing size. We're going to put this on here and fill it up with the kerosene oxygen. And as a first approximation, uh, we want about half of the delta V from this, a little bit more than half, because it's more efficient than the first stage engine is going to be. And we're looking to try and get 9,500 meters per second overall. So what we want is um, let's say 4,800 from this. And we can resize depending on how the thrust to weight ratios end up. So that's okay. The thrust to weight ratio is uh, surface right now. So that's why it's looking bad. But point, oh, well, we don't need this much delta V. So I was uh, going by the surface delta V. That's not good. Uh, that's a little bit more than half of uh, 9,500, and we see a thrust to weight ratio of one uh, thrust to weight ratio of 1.02. So that's very nice. So this is a good setup. Uh, if you were dividing by five, you would get more thrust to weight ratio. You'd get more from your upper stage in that case than the lower stage, probably. It depends on the on the weight of the tanks and all that. We haven't put the fairings on as well. Okay, and of course this is a more efficient engine than uh, the 300 second ISP that we were originally going with. Okay, so after that we've got an inner stage with a decoupler. You don't have to put a separate decoupler in Realism Overhaul. And we were going with a 4 meter rocket. We'll put a standoff distance. Now, because in Realism Overhaul the fuel needs to be settled down, we will want separation motors of some kind on the side of this. And two will do. Oh, we don't. Oh, we should put a control core so at least MacJeb can give us numbers. We could put a control core on the rocket itself instead of the payload. That will allow you to subassembly the rocket ahead of time so that you have that ready. So we could put an instrument section. Do we have a wider one? That's too wide. I think we'll go with this one for now. We'll tuck it into the tank for looks. Um, let me make sure it's got comms. It does. OK, so that's an additional mass. But then we can take off that one now. So Mechjeb, what does Mechjeb say? Okay, we want the little separatrons going down there. It says 2.6 seconds, so that'll be enough time for me to light the engine without worrying about the fuels being settled. And we see a nice thrust weight ratio of one. And we will go on to the next stage. Now, we can mix things up by using kerosene oxygen or the hypergolics, the UDMH. And we'll see, we're still looking for uh, 4,660 uh, 4, kilonewtons for the first stage. And so, well, there is the RD-180. <laughs> um, uh, if you want a kerosene oxygen option, it's a little bit low on thrust weight ratio, uh, but, but because we are more efficient than the 300 second ISP we were aiming for, it's probably all right. I mean, we've got a much more, we were aiming for 300 seconds ISP and this is 350. And this is going to be 338. So if you put this down here, it's probably OK. And this time we have two options. So let's just make sure we get the RD-180 option. And we need to get a total of 9,500 meters per second. So that, that'll get it for us. And we get uh, 1.33. So it's a little bit under thrust. And that's because I was looking at the vacuum instead of the sea level. And we've got a stoutish rocket. 
but it'll do the trick. And so, well, I suppose the thing to do will be to test it out. Uh, we don't need verniers on the first stage. This gimbal's just fine. I'll put it in line like this as if we are uh, intending to put like SREs on the side as if it was a Titan or something. You could always expand it like that. We could put Separatrons to pull this back as well, but it's probably not necessary as long as we have those. Okay, with the additional fairing we need to extend this a little bit. The higher the thrust to weight ratio at sea level, the lower the delta V requirement. You can get a rocket into orbit with 8,800 if you start off with a thrust to weight ratio of like 1.7. But that doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, you might be uh, launching a lower payload than you could otherwise have done with the same rocket if you just put more delta V in um, and, you know, sucked up the lower thrust to weight ratio. So you'll have to sort of feel that out. As you can see from the Saturn V, a low thrust to weight ratio is not always considered a bad thing if it suits the engines that you have available. And... We always stage launch clamps after lighting the engine because it takes time for the engine to spool up. This will be a very quick trip to orbit, more or less. Um, let's say uh, test two. We can see it's lower than 300 tons because of the higher efficiency of the engines compared to our initial estimate of 300 seconds. Okay, ignition. I should probably throttle up. And launch. Launching from Baikonur or higher latitudes will probably take a little bit more delta V, as will polar orbits, of course. If you can take a look at our orbital velocity, we start off at about 340-ish uh, meters per second here. The equator would be better. So, uh, 80 degrees at about 3 kilometers, maybe 2 kilometers. We're probably going a little bit steep here. In general, you don't want to point outside the prograde vector circle. <laughs> that would be probably a good guideline. There's an overall fairly normal trajectory. And if we take a look at the burn time for the upper stage, 4 minutes and 30 seconds, it's got a thrust weight ratio of uh, one, so we don't have to worry too much about it. We could probably leave it maybe a minute and a half of time to apoapsis to do the trick. So I'm taking a look at my time to apoapsis at the corner there, and I don't want it to go too high. Now because these are kerosene oxygen stages, we didn't really go with cryogenic tanks or anything like that. We didn't put insulation. Um, unless you're hanging out in orbit for a very long time with the stage, you probably don't need to worry about the MLI layers. No, our time to apoapsis is going too high now, so I'm just going to flatten out. This stage can throttle, actually, to some extent. But, separation and ignition. Okay, and... Uh, to allow this, we've got the one and a half minutes I planned, but we'll pitch up back to the prograde vector. And we can, well, we could probably separate the fairings now. That'll be fine. Because of the nice thrust to weight ratio of this stage in particular, we're probably going to be able to deliver this with plenty of room to spare. But again, this was all uh, first approximations that would ensure you know, an initial success kind of thing. And then afterwards you can put heavier loads on it, depending on how this turned out. The goal is to make sure that the initial test flight is as flawless as possible, without wasting too much. Okay, uh, we're getting in a sort of a lopsided situation here, but shut down. Uh, 298 by 156. Uh, basically, you would want this side of the orbit, the side that you're burning on, to end up being the periapsis. So if you're going for a higher apoapsis, you would just continue burning here, and, but this is the periapsis side. 
and we can see that we ended up with 421 meters per second so we can carry a somewhat heavier payload than we have here but it's at least in the ballpark all right uh, let's go back to the VAB so the question then becomes when do you need an extra stage when do you need a third stage as opposed to just having two stages when it would be more efficient and um, in fact technically uh, it would be more efficient to have a third stage right now even uh, to complete orbit and that's because the further away you get from the exhaust velocity of the engines the worse off it tends to get but then there's a competing problem of the cost I mean technically you could uh, get a little bit more efficiency a lighter rocket with a heavier payload if we sort of uh, added an extra little stage to push it with the final bit to orbit but then that would cost a little bit more because that little extra kicker stage uh, would be an extra cost and what we're generally aiming for is the exhaust velocity which is uh, 10 times let's say just as an estimate 10 times the vacuum ISP so 3384 meters per second would be sort of ideal to get out of the stage and we're using it for a little bit longer than that which is fine for again cost purposes and uh, uh, for the upper stage it would be like 3600 would be ideal and we're using it for a little bit longer uh, some it's not a very hard and fast rule and it does have to do with first of all legacy hardware for instance the Atlas V has the first stage going for an obscene amount of time and getting a lot of Delta V and then the upper stage the Centaur stage uh, doesn't actually do much for low Earth orbit though for uh, higher orbits it does a lot more work but uh, that's because the Centaur is a legacy stage that they're using and the first stage was the new stage so the first stage is doing a lot more of the work the flip side is with the Falcon 9 where the second stage does all the work like 6,000 meters per second which is nearly double uh, what it ought to be doing uh, and the first stage does very little but that's to ensure that the first stage can land uh, you don't want the first stage going very fast and it needs to reserve fuel and all that business so it was critical for the second stage to do a whole lot of work and so those are the reasons for those design decisions but I would say that uh, past this point where it's basically 1.5 times the optimal um, so you take the in this case 3600 multiplied by 1.5 that'd be 5400 would be where I'm going iffy about this and thinking I need another stage definitely so we wouldn't expect this to push something to the moon uh, but I mean it could I mean there's no if you have a small enough payload you'll get enough delta v you need 1000 uh, sorry 12,500 and we could get this to the moon so if you just add a small payload and this is what happens with the Atlas V a lot they just have small payloads sent to the moon or Mars or something like that and here we see that if we have just a 1.2 ton payload we could probably get this over to the moon if this engine could relight it doesn't it only has one ignition and so another thing that you have to look out for on your second stages is how many ignitions do you have if you're trying to go in lower form it you don't need to worry about that but since if we're going to try and configure this for the moon we need to find an engine that's going to have a second ignition and then we need to settle the fuel down we put these little SRBs on to settle the fuel down when it ignites initially but then one what about the second time and how does it point to its node we don't have reaction wheels in realism overhaul that are well, they're they're weak uh, they, they exist technically but they're weak and expensive they're 0.5 here and here uh, 1.0 and they take a lot of power so but let's find an engine with a lot of ignitions that uh, will do the job in general methane oxygen could be seen as a more efficient drop-in replacement for kerosene oxygen you can go with it like that so if trying to figure out how to use the methane oxygen engines they can do the same job as the kerosene oxygen for the most part looking at our engine choices I think uh, the problem is this doesn't have a whole lot of thrust but this is one of my favorites uh, you can see the five ignitions this is a good engine to send something to the moon 
and um, and beyond. It was used for a lot of interplanetary missions, and uh, it has better ISP in some of the other configurations that we have down here. They can easily match the engine we had before, except it has very low thrust, so you need a lot of them. And so you have to examine the cost of that. But I think that would probably be the best bet. And in my uh, career mode uh, series, it's not unusual for me to spam these uh, quite profusely because they're such good engines and they're relatively cheap. Uh, so these are the RD58s, I'll call them though, and they'll be under S1.5400. And uh, this one, for instance, is, was on Buran as its OMS engines. Uh, this is pretty typical, as you can see, seven ignitions, seven ignitions for that one. I'll just go with the standard RD58, and we will be able to see, I think we can get by with, a five is probably overdoing it. But the thrust wave ratio you can see there, we can see 7,429. That's quite a lot of delta V, but because of the small payload. Let's just... Uh, well, let's compare. That's 7,429, and then if we take them off, this one had, uh, and we need to, its fuel mixture, 7,732. So carrying the extra engines will hurt a little bit, but not a whole lot. We could put five of them on. It depends on the cost, though. Anyway, in principle, you could make a kerosene oxygen rocket with two stages that could launch a payload to the moon, but you can see not a very heavy payload. So. We would want a third stage, and if we want straight kerosene oxygen, let's just load up the test two rocket that we already launched with the 10 ton payload. So we've already got this rocket. It would be far, far better to simply add that RD-58 as a single third stage inside the payload and a single RD-58. Once you're in orbit, you don't have to worry about the thrust to weight ratio. So this is a very um, standard sort of arrangement. I'll set it to the RD-58 configuration, fill up the tank, and we see that we have enough to transfer to the moon, 3,484 with this 10-ton payload. The thrust to weight ratio is fairly low, uh, but if you can take your time, it has multiple ignitions, so you can do the burn on multiple passes. Uh, strictly speaking, I would budget 3,200 meters per second for the transfer. And again, we need RCS on this stage, but now we're not trying to put RCS on a larger stage. We just need one on a, uh, it on a smaller stage. So we just need it to orient the rocket and sell the fuel down. 223s should be good enough. And we'll need fuel for that. And they can't run on the kerosene and oxygen, so we need separate fuel tanks. Let's get some dumplings. And we can pick our fuel, oops, and the UDMH and NTO is pretty good if you can get it. And so we'll fill these with that UDMH and NTO mix. And that's probably more than we need, but uh, we'll compensate for adding that with additional fuel. So, but this is now a much heavier payload, it's 30 tons. so. Yeah, we want to resize all of this. How much... We we got a, we could get a little bit more than 10 tons into orbit. Now, we could do more with this engine, because right now we're only at, we're asking it to do less than it's optimal. We could have it finish orbit and then transfer the payload to the moon. So we can keep that in mind. So we could have the rest of the launcher do handle more than 10 tons. And what we want really is that this stage does about the same as this stage because their ISPs are about the same and you want to get about the same delta V from the engines that have the same ISP. So let's reduce the payload. We're not going to send 10 tons to the moon with a 300-ish ton rocket. And again, I'm going to look for 12,500 meters per second overall. So uh, right now we're not getting enough delta V and we have to reduce the payload to manage that. But we're gonna get a whole lot better than the 1.2 tons the two lower stages would have gotten on their own. And we can probably re decrease the decoupler size a bit. Okay, well that's more than 12,500. 
but this burn time on this stage is really long and this one is now providing less than it ought to. So let's uh, reshape that a little bit. You can see that uh, reducing the size of this tank isn't affecting our overall delta V that much. You can see we have a 12 minute burn time here. We reduce the burn time by quite a lot. Really, this engine should only have a 10 minute at, mo at most. But I'm reducing this, but it's not uh, hurting our delta V that much. We still got 12,600, and that's because now this stage is being less burdened and it's giving more delta V. And that's why we want them to sort of even out. And that's 12,500. They're both giving about the same delta V. This is giving a little bit more, but that's okay. And we might be able to get under the eight minute mark to be safer, but uh, we can try 3.54 tons. We're gonna put the fairings on in a sec, so that's an added mass. We could probably reduce the amount of uh, UDMH and NTO actually, but we'll we'll carry it as is for now. Okay, we'll we'll go with this rocket. We're still a 295 ton rocket sending 3.54 tons aiming for the moon. Of course, this is not going to get into lunar orbit. That's a separate thing. But this is going to just send it on a translunar trajectory. And in general, you can estimate that whatever you can get into low Earth orbit, if uh, you could probably get a third of that to the moon. Uh, it's a little bit better than a third when you're using hydrogen oxygen. Uh, you could maybe push closer to a half of what you get into lower orbit to the moon, but not really half, maybe maybe 40%. So that's what you're basically thinking of. Okay, so this is now a three-stage rocket capable of sending this payload to the moon. Let's go ahead, we'll call it test three, since it's a three-stage rocket. Now you have to remember that the third stage is going to be completing orbit. So you not only need the time for this stage, you also need the time for the third stage there. But it it's so close to getting to orbit at that point, you probably don't need to reserve too much. But we'll take a look. It says 12,386 now with the fairings on. We'll see if we can make it. It's going to be tight. But that'll make it interesting for me. Throttle up. The SAS is on. Ignition. And launch. <laughs> I, I actually released the launch clamps a little bit early, so it went down a bit. So you can see these two stages are now carrying basically 17 tons. But they are not getting that 17 tons to orbit. And this configuration is very similar. I mean, if you had hydrogen oxygen stages for the upper two stages instead, uh, like uh, Saturn V, where the first two stages do not uh, push the third stage and the payload to orbit. The third stage has to finish it. If you take a look at the delta Vs for the three stages of the Saturn V, you'll notice what I've said uh, all along, and that's that the first stage, if you multiply the ISP by 10, it's pretty close to what the first stage provides. The first stage actually provides a little bit more than that. Uh, because it's got all a nice thrust to weight ratio and it needs to make sure that the upper two stages um, get a uh, good time to apoapsis to do their burns. Uh, the second stage and the third stage pretty deliver pretty close to um, 10 times their vacuum ISP in Delta V. Another rocket that's uh, sort of ideal in that respect is Proton. Now here we've got the engine igniting at the same time as the Cybertrons. You can try that, but um, sometimes it'll work all right, sometimes it won't. It's a bit of a risk. Some engines play nicer with that. There is also hot staging, which is igniting the second stage engine before the first stage has run out. And that's on the rockets where you'll see sort of a grid uh, inner stage here, allowing the thrust to go through. And uh, the Titan rocket has that, the Soyuz has that. Okay, separation. We do have electric charge here, and it looks... I don't know if we have comms here, actually. That's a bit of a flaw. 
Uh, comms. Yeah, I don't think the Delta Avionics unit you know, has independent comms. I think we have to fix that. The guidance computer has comms. So I would want to keep the time to wrap waps uh, to about one minute so that the this stage has time to burn. We see a boil off loss here because the liquid oxygen is going to boil off but it shouldn't be so fast that it makes a huge difference when you're going to be doing your transfer burn within an orbit. We aren't going to hit the moon right now anyway, and that's because we didn't line up with it initially. You could do an off-plane transfer, and that is burning from the ascending or descending node, but this is pretty horrible. <laughs> this is pretty horrible as far as approaches are concerned. So of course with the estimate of how big a launcher is, you can work backwards and so uh, as a first case estimate if you uh, just take the the ISP the vacuum ISP of your first stage engines and divide by 100 you can uh, say that that's about the percentage of the total rocket mass that you, you can get to orbit to low earth orbit we're just sort of making rough estimates uh, so that we have reasonable assumptions for our first test and then we can operate from there so I don't know if we're going to have communications with this, unfortunately. Delta V wise, we're looking okay. Again, I'm trying to keep it to about one minute. Time to wap wapsis. Okay, and um, yeah. Oh, uh, I think we. Yeah, we don't have communication on this stage. Oh, maybe we do. Okay, so we're using the RCS here. I'm still thralled up, and can I ignite? I can. Okay. All right. Well, well we're in business. I'm so confused sometimes. All right, uh, maybe it's some difficulty settings. I am in sandbox after all. Um, so I'm just gonna point to zero right now, and I'll demonstrate an off-plane transfer since we didn't line up with the moon, I suppose. Because we're not launching from the equator, the prograde vector sort of wanders in a southern in the southerly direction. And you can see why, because we're launching from here, eventually it goes further and further south. So how do I know how much time to wrap lapses to leave? Well, a minute is a good estimate in general, but um, though I usually leave a minute and a half after the first stage, a minute and 40 seconds. Um, I'm just thinking about how much of the delta V we're going to use from this stage and uh, roughly estimating how much of the time, burn time I'm going to use, so I was estimating about two minutes of burn time, so I divided that in half because we'll do half of that burn before we reach apoapsis and half after. So that's one minute time to apoapsis. And you can see that's what we're basically doing here. We're going to reach apoapsis and then we're going to burn a little bit afterwards, still probably not a whole minute's worth. Now we have limited electric charge right now, of course, and uh, we don't have any way of replenishing it, so we really need to make the transfer soon. Oh, I can't shut it down. Ah, uh, I can't shut it down. We have enough to transfer to the moon, though. 3,300 meters per second, but for some reason, I can't. Yeah, okay, so it allowed me to start the engine, but it didn't allow me to stop the engine. That's sad. Can I lock the fuel tanks? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, okay, we might be okay, though we overburned a bit. Um, I can turn off our... I don't understand anything. Okay, that's fine. Um, Off-plane transfer. It's going to be, so the downside to off-plane transfer, and you definitely don't want to do this with crew, is that the actual transfer time will take a long time. We're going to try and meet up with the moon over here at this uh, point, the descending node, and we're going to burn out just a little bit ahead of the ascending node. We've got a, oh, we can't add a maneuver. Well, anyway, we'll do it on the fly uh, because I can't make a maneuver, but... I don't even know if I'm going to be able to start the engine, we'll see. But just ahead of the ascending node, not at it. And that's because what's going to happen on our other side of the orbit is we're going to have our apoapsis point away, uh, above the moon's orbit and then come back in. That will delay long enough for the moon to get there. If we just uh, touch the moon's orbit, it'll take us two days to get there, but the moon will be only about here-ish, which is a normal transfer. 
So we would expect the moon to go a little bit ahead and meet up with it here. But if we're trying to meet up with it there, we need to delay. So we need to have an apoapsis that's higher and then come back in to delay long enough. Okay, so... But without being able to plot, it's a little bit hard. We're just going to point prograde RCS on. I don't know if I can throttle up now. Okay, I don't think I can... I wonder if... Oh. Oh wait, that, that, that worked. Alright. Here we go. <laughs> so random. I'm probably not going to be able to stop this in time. So for selling the fuel down, you can use either RCS or the little Separatrons. But if it's a heavy stage, you probably want to go with the Separatrons, the RCS, that are not going to be powerful enough. So aside from in the launcher, the hypergolic fuels are going to be used for anything that is going to take a long time. So all the kerosene oxygen, the hydrogen oxygen, or methane oxygen, that's all you do to burns in low Earth orbit. Um, until we get like an ACES stage, you're probably not carrying the kerosene oxygen all the way to the moon. Though N1 uh, did kerosene oxygen at the moon. It had uh, a lot of kerosene oxygen stages there. Uh, well, not a lot. It has the RD58 stage, basically, at the moon. And that started the descent of the lander. It captured everything into orbit and started the descent of the lander. But other than that, not a whole lot. Oh, we sort of missed it. But anyway, we could have hit it if I could have made a maneuver node. And we are on escape. Not a very useful escape, though. Anyway, but with uh, this rocket, we could have gotten a five point, uh, sorry, 3.54 ton payload to the moon. And it demonstrates the benefits of staging, because with the two stages we could only manage 1.2 tons. Anyway, back to the VAB. So aside from what has been said already, with the hydrogen-oxygen engines, uh, let's say this RD0146, again they tend to be pricey, uh, but you'll want the MLI layers on the tank, and that will uh, add insulation so the boil off is not so bad, but you're probably not carrying them for too far unless you got some special system in, you know, built in like Asus does. And I don't know if any mod has that. I had to make my own sort of deal and it's not very good. But uh, yeah, hypergolic fuels for the long stuff, the, uh, you know, moon landings, the, the Apollo lunar lander had hypergolic fuels, the service module had hypergolic fuels, so that's aerozine, UDMH, uh, anything to do with hydrazine. If you see a zine in there, that's all payload stuff, basically. Um, for the launcher, when we talk about a launcher, we're not talking about doing things at the location, we're talking about everything that's going to be happening uh, up to geosynchronous orbit. Uh, as far as getting into geosynchronous orbit, the amount of delta V you need is about 4,200 meters per second. You remember that we used 3,200 to travel to the moon. It would take about 800 to capture into lunar orbit. So geosynchronous orbit actually takes more delta V than getting to, into lunar orbit. And um, you're basically doing a 2,400 meter per second, well, sorry, 2,600 meter per second burn initially. And then depending on where you're launching from, it could be anywhere from 1,500 to more than that. If you're launching from Kuru, for instance, you're at a low inclination, you don't have to correct as much inclination. If you're launching from Cape Canaveral, that's more inclination you have to correct. And so basically getting into geosynchronous orbit is about the same as a transfer to Mars. 4,200 meters per second is what you'd budget for that. And we could go on. You can look at a Delta V map for stuff like that. But, you know, uh, the same system could be used for getting to the moon, getting to geosynchronous orbit, and getting to Mars. That's uh, sort of a way to go. So you can think about that. Anyway, with that being said, I think I've said enough. That's quite a lot to handle. If you have any questions, please do ask them. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.